morning refreshed church. Will you stand with us and worship our wonderful God? cross won your freedom sing to the lord if you know that he saves tell all the earth that his arms are wide open salvation is in his name let the lost be found let the blind eyes see let the music play let the people see let the people sing. Hey. Worship the Lord in the light of His presence. Worship the Lord with the angels and saints. Tell all the earth that the Savior is risen. The stone has been rolled away. Let the dead rise up, Come on. let the bound run free, let the church have faith, let the people see, let the people see, for great are you Lord, worthy of praise, Jesus your love has defeated the grave. Let the people see. Let the people see. Oh, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise. Jesus, your love has defeated the grave. Let the people see. Sins 
Lord of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. And fighting our battles, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord Almighty?
and I will believe it. Come on, church. I will believe it. You make mountains move. You make giants fall. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fear, and I will preach to my doubt. You were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Oh, you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. And I know that I know you never fail. Come on. Oh, yes, I know that I know you never will. And I know that I know. Giants fall, you move songs of praise to shake prison walls, and I will speak to my fear. Come on, and I will preach to my doubt. You were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. You make mountains move, you make giants fall, you use songs. Take prison walls, and I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubt. You were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. Oh, you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. Oh, yes, you are faithful. Oh, you are so faithful. You make mountains move, you make giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fear, I will preach to my doubt. You were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. You were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Oh God, Father, we are so grateful that you are faithful, that we can come confidently, that we can speak to our fear and preach to our doubt that you have already gone before us and we can walk confidently into your holy presence, God. So I just thank you that we get to celebrate that today. I thank you for another great Sunday. I thank you that you are present here in the house of Refresh this morning. And God, I ask that you just bless the message that Pastor Chris is gonna bring. May his words be your words. And may we all just leave here a little bit more refreshed. And all God's people said, amen and amen, amen. Can y'all turn to your neighbors this morning and uh, just say, I am glad you're here at church today. Good morning, church. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm Pastor Chris. And my name is Janine. On your way in, you probably got a Connect card from a Surf Team member. On the front of that card, there is little boxes for you to check. If it's your first time here, let us know. We'd love to meet you. We'd love to give you some information. If you'd like information on discovery or small groups, or you'd like to commit your life to Jesus, all those spots for you to check. On the back of that card is for your sermon notes and your prayer requests. The staff prays over these praises and prayer requests every single week. Yeah. It is a f so fun to read and pray with you guys. And when you turn in that card, we donate $1 to Key of Hope. And we just have a couple opportunities that we want to share with you today. First and foremost, coming up on July 13th is our next family kickball. It is so much fun. We go out, play some kickball. We have some food. It's a fantastic time. Pastor Sam gets hurt. 
every single year. So make sure you get a front row seat for that. You can sign up online or you can get some information out in the lobby. Our other opportunity coming up is on July 14th, and that's our next discovery party. Yeah. If you want to know more about the church, the staff, your gifts, that is where you come and find those things out. It is directly after service on July 14th at our HQ location. That's right. Here at Refresh, our mission is to see every person refreshed and every purpose discovered. And we have several ways that you can partner with us in that, but one is by giving. We're a giving church, and we believe that when you give, God can do abundantly more with that than we can do on our own. So we have three ways that you can give here. You can go online, you can text any amount to 84321, or you can drop it in the offering boxes in the back. And when you do give, you give to things like Key of Hope, which gives aid to kids in Africa who are going through the AIDS epidemic right now. So thank you so much, you guys. We hope you have a fantastic Sunday, and we'll see you out there. See ya. So, good morning, church. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, as the video announcements said, I am Pastor Chris. And our lead pastor, Pastor TJ, is out of town this week. Uh, he's out on a well-deserved anniversary trip to Hawaii, of all places. So we're so happy that they get that opportunity to go and kind of rejuvenate and recuperate. And you guys are left with me today. So we're going to have a good morning, I promise. So... We're going to continue in our Binge the Bible series, and what we're doing here, much like if you've sat down and just gone through an entire series of Netflix at a time, we're kind of doing that. We're going through an entire book of the Bible one week at a time for seven weeks all together. And I want to give you a little bit of a recap from what we've seen the last two weeks. So two weeks ago, Pastor TJ started us off with Genesis, and he showed us that through seven patriarchs or father figures... God kind of creates this model through which the entire history of humanity is going to be lived. And then last week, we spoke about Exodus. And he talks about how the Israelite people, they kind of start in the Garden of Eden, this place of promise and paradise. They end up going into captivity, but then they're going out of captivity, captivity into the promised land, which is another Eden-type home for them. So that was back to the future because they're going back to the promised land that God had for them, which brings us today to Leviticus. And man, if you know me, I like rules, so I don't know that there was a more fitting book for me to preach on today, okay? I'm going to try and keep it light, okay? Leviticus can be kind of, we think it can be kind of boring, but man, when I dove into this, I, got, I had a new appreciation for it, let me tell you. So Leviticus and Deuteronomy can kind of have this bad rap, I think, for Christians today, we're like, oh, that doesn't apply to us anymore because that's old law. It's all these old laws. It's like 650 plus laws that the Israelites had to adhere to, but we don't have to anymore. And I'm here to tell you today that that is just not true. When Jesus came in Matthew, he, said, he didn't say that the Old Testament didn't apply to us anymore, quite the opposite. He said he came to fulfill the law. And the law is the first five books of the Testament plus the prophets, right? It's the Torah, the Pentateuch. But underlying these things, underlying all of these laws, there is a, there's a greater principle that God wanted us to get that we missed. And that's why Jesus speaks against the Pharisees, because the way that they applied the law was mishandled. Jesus, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about murder. He says, if you murder you subject yourself to judgment. And then he says, but I say to you, if you so much as look at somebody in an angry manner, you subject yourself to judgment. You see, Jesus is taking this great action, this great sin of murder, and he's looking at the underlying theological principle, which is the condition of our heart. And that's what Jesus wants from us. That's what God wants from us. They want our heart. So, with that being said, what is the purpose of all of these laws in Leviticus? The answer is kind of simple, and it's simply to make us holy. All of these laws are meant to make us holy. So fun fact, uh, and my wife, when I told her this, she wasn't as excited. She called it nerdy. But hey, I'll let you uh, decide what it is, okay? Did you know that the word holy appears more often in Leviticus than in any other book in the Bible? And in fact, it makes up about two-thirds of all occurrences in the Bible. 
So with that being said, Leviticus today actually ends up being a handbook for holiness. So with that being said, would you close your eyes in prayer with me as we get ready to dive into the word for today? Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for today, Father, and I thank you for every single person that's here. Father, I pray that as we dive into your word, that we can see that there is still application for us to be had today. That we don't throw away any part of your word, but rather the entirety of your word is what guides us and changes our hearts. And I pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. So, if Leviticus is a handbook, handbooks are kind of important. They need to be read, right? They're kind of like instruction manuals. So my son Titus just turned six not too long ago, and he loves Legos. In fact, I think all he got was Legos for his birthday. It's true. <laughs> and he does pretty good now. He, he reads the instructions pretty well. Like, I don't have to step in and help him as much. But I remember a time, maybe even just two years ago, where he would read these instructions, and he'd start at step one, and by the time step 25 came around, the thing would just be a mess. Pieces wouldn't be on quite right, or he'd miss something, and he'd be like, There's, this piece isn't here, and I'm like, it's right there. He's like, that's not it. I'm like, yes, it is. And so it's just, he gets frustrated, I get frustrated, he starts crying, I start crying. It's just this big fiasco, okay? But the reality is that when, we, when he wouldn't follow those instructions, his creation was either shaky or it didn't fall apart entirely. And that's what this is. If we don't follow the handbook that God has given us, what ends up coming out will either be shaky or fall apart entirely. So we're going to take a look at this handbook today, and we're going to see what it has for us. So just a little bit of background. Like the rest of the Pentateuch, Leviticus was written by Moses. And chronologically, it actually falls in the, kind of in the middle of the book of Exodus. This is something that God gives to Moses while they're at Mount Sinai. So, you know, Moses goes up the mountain, he gets the Ten Commandments. It's within the first year of the Exodus, since they've left Egypt. And he comes back down, and these are accompanied with him. Now, the name Leviticus, kind of like the name Exodus, right? We talked, Pastor TJ talked about yesterday how it's a little uh, misunderstood. I think Leviticus can be kind of the same way. Um, the tribe of Levi was meant to be God's priests, the priests of the people, and so when we read the book of Leviticus, we could be forgiven for thinking it applies only to the priests, but that's not the case. Leviticus means something like priestly conduct or priestly like. While it does address the priest directly at some points, this book is meant for the entirety of God's people, the entirety of the Hebrew nation. And we see that expressed in Exodus 19.6, which says, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. This is not meant for just the priests. It's meant for all of us. So what's its purpose? To make us holy, yes, but also when we consider where the Israelites are coming from, they're just coming out of captivity, and they've spent centuries in Egyptian culture. And God has to get that culture out of his people and replace it with a new identity, and that's what these laws are meant to do. He has two purposes. He's showing, number one, that he is set apart. Last week, we talked about the plagues and how each plague is actually God judging the Egyptian gods all the way up to Pharaoh. God is showing that he is a different God. And he's also showing that his people are called to be different. They're called to be different from the Egyptians where they came from. And later on, we'll see that they're called to be different from the Canaanites, where they're going to in the promised land. God is calling his people to be set apart from the rest of the world. You will be different, he says. So Leviticus has 27 chapters in it. I'm not going to go into each one, okay? I'm, I'll relieve you of that right now. <laughs> it's kind of broken up into two sections. Chapters 1 through 10 is kind of like the way to the Holy One, and chapters 11 through 27 is kind of like the way to holiness. Okay? And they're kind of broken up into further small sections from there, but we don't have to get into that. So chapter 1 of Leviticus, verse 1, opens with, the Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle. Uh, I'm going to pause right there. I know we just started, but I'm going to pause already. Okay? 
Why is God speaking to Moses from the tabernacle? That gives us the impression that Moses is not yet within the tabernacle. So the question why is answered with the fact that he's not yet been made pure. He can't yet enter into God's presence. Because what we've seen up to this point is God has come down to meet his people. God has come to us. Even on Mount Sinai, God comes down to reside on the top of the mountain, and Moses does go to him, but that's kind of God coming down to us. And so for the first time since the Garden of Eden, God is residing somewhere here on earth where his people can come to him. But Moses can't yet because he's not pure, because God cannot abide sin. Now, if you're new to this whole thing, I want to make it clear. The tabernacle then that we see is not the church today, okay? You do not have to be 100% pure to enter church, quite the opposite. What ends up happening is Jesus comes, the Holy Spirit abides in us, and we become the temple. We become the tabernacle where God resides, okay? I want to make that abundantly clear. But if we look back at Moses, he's standing outside of the tabernacle, and this brings us to point number one for today which is that sin separates us from God. And you might think that's kind of obvious, and to be fair, it kind of is. It's kind of replete throughout the entire Bible, but I think that sometimes we consider this like metaphorically. We're like, oh, that's true, I know that's true, but we don't consider the fact that there is a literal physical separation from God when we sin. Moses could not enter into God's presence. We build a wall between God and us that we cannot climb over, go around, or go under on our own when we sin. It creates a physical separation. But we'll see that God provides a way for us, okay? So if we move on into the book of Leviticus, we look at chapters 1, 2, and 3. These are offerings. And we have the burnt offering, which is meant to atone for sin. We have the grain offering, which is meant to be like thanksgiving and worship to God. And then we have the peace offering, which is meant to just do exactly that, express your peace with God and how you are with him. And these three offerings were kind of optional. You didn't have to do them, but it was like the state of your heart. If you're feeling thankful, go give God an offering. Thank him for what he's done for you. But then we get into chapter four, which is a little different. And we see the sin offering. And it's stated that the sin offering is for unintentional sins. And you might be like, that's weird, unintentional sins. Well, if you remember, these people just came from Egypt, and now they've been given like 650-ish laws that they have to follow. I'm not sure they can memorize all of them immediately, right? So there's going to be times where they recognize, oh man, that was a sin. I shouldn't have done that. And that's where this offering comes in. The moment that we be become aware of our sin, they became aware of their sin, they were meant to give an offering to God. And if we look at verse 3, chapter 4, four verse 3, we see this, this statement, if the high priest sins, bringing guilt upon the entire community, he must give a sin offering for the sin he has committed. Have you ever considered the fact that our sin affects everybody else around us? The high priest here, who is Aaron at this point, before he can do anything else, he has to atone for his sins because his sins affect the entire community. When we're talking about things like generational sins, it's not necessarily that our sin is our children's sins, but our sins affect them. When we're looking at things like abuse in a family, in a household, that affects the children. God called a people, not a person. Our sin affects everybody else around us. Okay, so we move on to chapter 5, and we've got guilt offerings. And these are offerings you make because of various things that make you unclean. And then chapter 6, we see sins that require a guilt offering. And we get a couple categories. The first three are things that make you unclean again, like touching carcasses of animals or touching somebody that's impure that makes you impure. But then the fourth category is a little interesting. And the fourth thing that requires a guilt offering is a foolish vow. And when I think about this, if I think about Egyptian culture, there was a tendency to make a vow to a god, right? In fact, in, in Jewish culture later on, we see that they would often make vows to God. The problem with a vow to God 
is you kind of got to keep it. So what we would see is they would make vows to lesser things. Oh, I swear by the temple that I'll pay you back. Oh, but that, I just swore by the temple. That's not, that's not that serious. I don't need to keep that. So Egyptian culture, they would swear by various gods. And you can imagine if you have lots of gods, they kind of believe different things. So it's really easy to be like, oh, I swear by Ra that I'll do that. Oh, but, uh, you know, Nut doesn't want me to do that. So I think I'm good. I'm not going to do that. So God is telling his people, you need to be people of your word. You need to be set apart, which, by the way, is what holy means. God's saying, you will not just make a foolish vow. You won't make it to me. You won't make it to anybody else. When you make a vow, you're going to keep your word because you are going to be different. That's what I've called you out to do. And we hear in pop culture all the time, oh, I swear to God, that's a foolish vow. We hear it all the time. There's a tendency to just carelessly throw about vows. We can't do that. We have to be people of our word because that's who God calls us to be. So when we move on, we get chapter 7, which is kind of like the priest part in the offerings. And then chapter 8, we get the anointing of the priests. And then if we look at verse 34, we see this. Everything we have done today was commanded by the Lord in order to purify you, making you right with him. Which leads me to our second point today, which is that God provides us a way back to him. So point number one, sin separates us from God. Point number two, God provides us a way back to him. And really, if we look at this book, we can see that the very thing that God is grounding the identity of his people on is his grace. The first eight chapters are all about how we can sin, or if we sin, I should say, we can provide an offering and we can come back to God. The identity of his nation is founded upon God's grace from the very beginning. And the reality is that whatever we identify with is what we end up worshiping, right? So if we were to take that identity on as children of God, it would be easier for us to worship him. But if they didn't have that identity, if they were still lost in Egyptian culture, if that was still their identity, they would have a hard time worshiping God. And we see that today. I can say just from my own experience, in the Marine Corps, when you go to boot camp, the entire intent is to break down your identity and rebuild a new one. You're no longer an individual. You're part of this like homogenous whole. You, I, I, no joke, in boot camp, you have to refer to yourself as this recruit. There's no I, there's no we. And when I got out, or even while I was in the Marine Corps, if somebody would ask me, what do you do? I would say, I am a Marine. Not, I'm in the Marine Corps. But I am a Marine, because that's what my identity was. The problem with that is that when I got out, it came crashing down. I worshipped the environment that I am. I worshipped my ability to do and score well on our physical fitness tests. I worshipped every single aspect of it, and it came crashing down. Because the things that we identify with here in this world, they're all temporary. Every single one. I saw this video on social media that had a panel of like successful businessmen and one guy was dominating the conversation, and he said that to him, a man was somebody who had it all. They were jacked. They had lots of money. They had a beautiful wife, a successful family. That's what it meant to be a man. And further down the line was a Christian. Now, admittedly, he wasn't in like as good of shape as this gentleman, but he kind of pushed back on that a little bit. He pushed back on this materialistic worldview. And it ate at the first guy, like so bad. It was like he was attacking him personally, but that's not what it was. And I can't help but wonder, if that guy had an injury and he couldn't work out the way he was anymore, what happens to his identity? It falls apart. Not just because we, we die and we leave it all here, but like just something so simple as an injury. 
We have to ground our identity in Christ if we want to be able to worship him fully. So let's move on to chapter 9. I'm, if I spend even a minute per chapter, we're going to be here for forever. So I'm going to try and keep, the, keep this going. <laughs> chapter 9, uh, we see that the priests begin their work. They're just kind of going about what they need to do. And then chapter 10, we get a really interesting story. We get the story of Nadab and Abihu. And these are Aaron's sons. So Leviticus 10, 1 through 3 says, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died there before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, I will display my holiness through those who come near me. I will display my glory before all the people. And check this out. And Aaron was silent. So why was Aaron silent? It's because he'd done the same thing. Back in Levitic, or excuse me, Exodus, when the people, when Moses is up on Mount Sinai, the people want to create an idol for themselves, right? And Pastor TJ talked about this. Aaron allows them to fashion a golden calf. They take time to fashion it. And then when Moses comes back down the mountain, he says, what's this? What happened here? What did you do? And Moses makes this lame excuse like, oh no, it just came out. It just came out that way. It's this miraculous thing. Aaron had already disobeyed what God had done. He'd set the example for his sons. So for them, when they take on this priesthood, they're like, oh, I can just do it my own way and nothing's going to happen. You want to talk about generational sin? Aaron was the example they had to follow. And so Aaron knew that he couldn't say anything. He had caused that. Which takes us to point number three. God cares about the little things. Now, this is really important. Because I think so often we can overlook our sin or try to explain it away. But the reality is that the little things lead to the big things. If you are venting to somebody and you're not careful and you cross the line into gossip, that's a sin. And I think that's one we overlook sometimes. But the reality is that that sin affects the person that you're talking to, affects you, and affects the person that you're talking about. God cares about the little things. If you are married, I might ruffle a little feathers with this one here. I'm sorry, there is no reason for you to have a friend of the opposite sex. I'm just going to say it. Because that opens the door to potential that you don't need. Put those guardrails up because the little things lead to the big things. If we struggle with alcohol, we shouldn't be going in liquor stores. Your decision-making process breaks down right there, and it leads to bigger things. Okay. A little bit of a harsh transition here, but we're going to kind of move into the second half of Leviticus, and this is where we get into personal conduct, the way to holiness. And what we're going to do now I'm going to take like an, a bird's eye view and hone in on a few things, and then we're going to come back out, okay? Are you good with that? Okay, well, it's happening, so. <laughs> so we see chapters here that deal with things like which animals to eat that make you clean or unclean, uh, how mothers are purified after birth, skin diseases, treatment and quarantine of contaminated houses. Uh, oh, chapter 15 is fun, bodily discharges. Anybody want to talk about bodily discharges this morning? I don't either. I got three boys. I, I'm good. <laughs> And then we move on to chapter 16, which is about the Day of Atonement. And this is interesting placement, because we see later on in chapter 23, that chapter down here is dedicated to festivals. And the Day of Atonement is a festival. But the placement of chapter 16 kind of bridges the gap here. And what's interesting about the Day of Atonement is, from the very beginning, from the book of Leviticus, we get a Christ-like figure. So on the Day of Atonement, it happens every year. The high priest would make a sin for himself, he'd be purified, and then they would take two goats, and they would slaughter one, they would sacrifice it, and then the other one would be set free. And the one that was set free is called the scapegoat. 
they would place their sins upon that goat and it would be set free. And what we see in just two goats is Christ who died for our sins, his blood covered them, he rose from the grave and he bared them for us and lived again. From the very beginning, we get to see a Christ-like figure in the identity of the Jewish people. Christ-like idea, not figure. Let me clarify that. God's not a goat. Um, <laughs> Then we're moving on to personal conduct, and again, there's a lot of contrast here from where they came from. Don't do these things. There's prohibitions against drinking and eating blood. And chapter 18 opens with, do not act like the people in Egypt or the people in Canaan. It talks about sexual practices, prohibited sexual practices, and sacrificing to a god named Molech. Now, Molech was the head of like the Canaanite pantheon. He's like the head god for the Canaanites. And they would sacrifice their children to him. In order to please this god, they would sacrifice their children to him. And this god is actually tied directly to Baal that we see throughout the Bible. Same god. And again, God is like, you're not going to do that. You were called to be holy. He's telling his people that they can't be like where they came from and they can't be like where they're going. They can't be part of the world because they're called to be different. If we give God our lives, he's going to take us places in which we have to be set apart. Whether it's our jobs, our families, our friends, our neighborhoods, we're called to be set apart from them so that we can lead them to God. That's what God wants from us. Okay, we're going to move on a little bit. We go on and we see a collection of various rules for personal conduct. We see punishments for not listening to the commands, rules for priests and unacceptable sacrifices. And then again in 23, we see these festivals. And I thought this was kind of interesting because if it's a handbook for holiness, and God's like, this is how you're going to worship me, we see that God cares about our worship, not just like in our discipline, but in the good times too. God wants us to celebrate what he's done for us, right? That's what this entire chapter is about. Hey, each holiday that you're going to celebrate, it's because this happened. It's because I delivered you. It's because of this. It's because of this. And so I'm curious, who here, I want you to raise your hands for this, who here has God moved in an amazing way? I want you to raise your hand, whether it's healing, whether it's financial support, whether it's restoration of relationships, whether it's just deliverance in general. I want you to raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. Okay, now look around. Keep your hands up. Can we celebrate that for a second? Like, how many people are here that God has moved in a mighty way? Because if it's worth celebrating now, it's worth celebrating 10 years from now, right? If it's worth celebrating now, it's worth celebrating 30 years from now. These are the moments that we have to focus on because when things get bad in the wilderness, those are the moments that we go back to. We remember God was faithful in those times. He'll be faithful in these times. That is something that the Israelites forgot. One year after their exodus, they're creating idols and they say that a golden calf is what saved them. God wants us to worship him in the good times too. Okay, so moving on, we get to chapter 24, talking about bread and blasphemers, and then we get the eye for an eye statement. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this. We see it in Exodus, we also see it in Deuteronomy, I'm pretty sure. And it's known as the lex talionis. And when we read it, we see something that's like, if you poke your neighbor's eye out, they're going to poke yours out. And when we read this, I think sometimes we think it's a justification for vengeance and violence. But that doesn't seem like the God we worship, right? And it's not. Because the reality is, it's the exact opposite. Because the cultures of the time in the ancient Near East, they had this practice where you could mutilate somebody, you could cut off their finger, you could gouge out their eye, and all you had to do was pay money. That's it. If, especially if you were a higher status citizen. But here, God is saying, no, 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 no. They're made in my image too. You're going to be set apart because you're going to treat every single human, foreigner, slave, it doesn't matter. You're going to treat every single human with the dignity and the respect they deserve because I love them and they're made in my image. You're going to be different. 
Are we starting to see the pattern here throughout the entirety of this book? So when we move on, we get a chapter about the Sabbath year and the year of the Jubilee, times dedicated to rest and honor God. And then we get to chapter 26. And there's 27 chapters, I said, and chapter 27 is kind of an addendum. Chapter 26 kind of bookends the entirety of this book of Leviticus. And verses 1 through 13 are about blessings for obedience. Verse 3 reads, If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. God's saying, if you follow my commandments, there will be blessing. Now, I'm not talking about a prosperity doctrine. I'm not saying you're going to get a lot of money, but I'm telling you what you are going to get is you are going to get a God who is mighty and who is powerful and is who, who is on your side through each and every single thing that you're going to go through. You're going to get salvation and God's going to be with you and he will not forsake you. Those are the blessings that we receive. Verses 14 through 40 are about disobedience. So we've got 13 verses about obedience and literally twice the amount, 26 about disobedience kind of gives us an idea of what God cares about more, right? Why? Because if we're disobedient, we're physically separated from God. God does not want to lose a single one of his children to sin. He wants to spend eternity with each and every single person. Of course, he's going to be more concerned about disobedience. And then it closes out with a way coming back to obedience. And we see that God bookends this entire book with his grace, with his grace. That's what he, that's the God that he is. It begins and ends with his grace. And then lastly, chapter 27 is about our vows to God. And we start to see why a foolish vow requires a guilt offering because he takes vows seriously. So this brings me to our last point for today, that holiness equals perfection. Wait a minute, that's not right. Can we throw the next one up? Have you ever felt like you needed to be perfect to come to church? Have you ever felt like you needed to be perfect to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I'm here to tell you that you don't have to because the reality is that holiness equals obedience. You might ask, what's the difference? Well, Moses, when he's called by God, he makes excuses, but he ends up being obedient. God doesn't expect perfection, otherwise he wouldn't dedicate eight chapters to how we come back to him every single time we sin. What he wants is our hearts. The Old Testament law was meant to change our hearts, and we see this even throughout the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 15, 22 says, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? We don't adhere to these ceremonial laws anymore because we are under a new covenant, now, if this is your first time here, I'm not telling you to go home and sacrifice animals. Please don't do that, okay? It's not good. But the reality is that when Jesus came, he makes it abundantly clear that sin is a condition of the heart. We can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. The Old Testament law was meant to change our hearts. That's all it was ever meant for. So my challenge for everybody here today is to not cast aside what the law has to teach us. The entirety of God's word has wisdom. Not just part of it, all of it. And if we look at this handbook for holiness, and we see that God wants us to be set apart, we can find that holiness through obedience. Now, maybe you haven't accepted Jesus yet. 
You're kind of like, I don't, I'm not under that yet. I don't know what that means. I'm here to tell you that you can do it right here and right now. So would everybody bow your heads and close your eyes with me, please? If you haven't accepted Jesus, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, and I, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the grave. I recognize and accept him as my Lord and Savior. Would you come into my heart and change my life? Amen. Okay. Now we're going to get ready to go into a time of reflection and worship. We'll have prayer partners down here. We've got communion off at the sides. We've got the cross that you can literally lay your burdens at the foot of. But take this time. Take this time for a moment of obedience to worship him no matter where you're at. Oh, don't 
you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Hey, hey. Oh, we praise you Yes, we praise the Lord Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your holiness that you've granted upon us, God. We thank you for the opportunity to come and praise you with those around us. And we thank you so much. And we're so full of gratitude for who you are and for who you have always been. In your name we pray, amen. May you go out with joy and be led forth with peace, refreshed church. Have a good week.